So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Source Material Comics Podcast. We are coming at you with episode 267. That's right, I think. So, here joining me this evening <laughs> is one Mark Radlich. Mark Radlich, are you ready to talk some comic books tonight? I am ready to rock! He's ready to rock and roll. So, we have... Sonic the Hedgehog it has just released in theaters, correct? Yes, it came out Friday. Okay. On Valentine's right. Day, because I am a super romantic, treated my wife and children to seeing Sonic the Hedgehog on Valentine's oh, Day. Wow. Isn't like, and your son like pumped up for this thing like it's the second coming of something or something? He was because we saw it on Friday. That's right. So he he's actually going to be uh, joining you guys as well. You said family, right? The whole family's going? The whole family went. The whole family went. That's great. Because <laughs> it was last Friday. Get it? I get it. I get it. Well, okay. So y'all got to go see Sonic the Hedgehog, and that's why we're doing this book. Am I correct? Is there anything else? You are else? correct, sir. Yes. Ah, all right. Okay. So we're tying this in with the release of Sonic the Hedgehog, the movie, which, man, oh, man, uh, this, is, this is a property that, you know, I've devoted a lot of time to Sonic. And here lately, I've been even doing that some more, and I'll explain why. But let me ask you first i know me and you've talked about video games in the past you know when it my impression is that you were not the guy that sat down and played a whole lot of video games you played some but you didn't do a whole lot am i right i played sonic the hedgehog i had a sorry i'm sucking on a horse here i had a gen i had a genesis oh okay of course, well for, common ground know, so if you had a sega genesis you most likely had the sonic game i mean granted the one that i had came with altered beast Rise from your grave. You beat me to it. I was waiting for you to stop, and I was going to do it, and you fucking beat me to it. <laughs> I got my Nintendo. I, was just, I just shared this on uh, uh, Facebook there over the weekend where my son had turned 10 on the 9th of February, and when I turned 10, I got my first ever Nintendo. So it was three years after that in 1991 I got my first Sega Genesis, but I can remember going over to my buddy's house and he had the Sega before I did. And I was amazed at what I was seeing on the screen uh, with Altered Beast. He had Altered Beast. He had a couple other, I think he had a sports game as well. Uh, but uh, so you, did you end up buying Sonic the Hedgehog or how did you get a hold of it? Yeah, I had a whole bunch of Sega Genesis games. I had Joe Montana football. Remember that? Uh, that was one of the first ever like football games I ever bought was Joe Montana Sports Talk Football. Oh, so great. And then a couple years after that, he's playing for the Chiefs. Uh. <sighs> I could I could tell you that I wasted so much of my parents' money by huh. not going to class at college and staying home and playing NFL primetime ninety five with a buddy of mine uh, over and over and over. So this was 97. Uh, so we were still playing the Genesis back then. What do you think of Sonic? I mean, was this something that blew your mind well, when you had the chance to play it? Sonic the Hedgehog was the Sega Genesis answer to Nintendo's uh, Mario Brothers, obviously. <laughs> it was the same basic concept. You know, it was a left to right kind of movement thing. You were this little avatar dude who uh, could spin really fast. And he ran. If you press a certain button, he uh, curled up into a ball and became like, you know, super destructive and all of that. And the whole concept was to gather as many rings as you could uh, at the, you know, to get to the end of the level. And of course, your Bowser of the game was the Eggman, Dr. Dr. Robotnik. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I I played that. I don't, I don't think I got too far. I probably got a couple of iterations of the game because I remember being able to play with Tails. Okay. You know, whose tail would be like a propeller. Yeah. And I vaguely remember Knuckles. Okay, so that's Sonic 3. Um, that's just probably as far as it got. And my, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of reliving a lot of this stuff now because my son loves the shit out of Sonic. I did this right after Christmas. Treated myself to a, a, a quick little Christmas present. It was only 10 bucks because it was on sale. But Sonic Mania. I uh, bought the game for my son for getting a good report card. All right, my man. Have you had a chance to play it? Because, man, is it a throwback? Nah, I don't play the bullshit. Oh, I don't play, I don't play no <laughs> video games. I don't play no, no video games. I, I do. Don't. They're just on my phone when I'm, when I'm watching Raw because it's garbage <laughs> in the background. <laughs> I got that from my son. He loves the shit out of it. He, you know, he's just starting to learn how to read, but he's got, he owns a couple of Sonic comic books because I'm an idiot. And I was like, yeah, buy comics. I don't know how to read. Shut up. <laughs> Look at the pictures. So he owns a couple of, of so uh, IW, IDW Sonic trades. Okay. And he's got the game and he's really into it. He was super, you know, excited for the movie. He loved the movie. That's good. That's real good. <laughs> I, I'm glad he wasn't let down. 
No, he was not let down. All right. The movie was fun for the whole family. So, yeah, um, I haven't played any of Sonic Mania yet, but my son has. He's played a bunch of it. He um, he tends to oscillate between, like, playing Sonic Mania, and then he'll, like, jump over and play Lego Undercover, and then he'll jump back and play something else. And then he like, he'll like he just get bored of the Switch altogether and be like, back to Plants vs. Zombies on the iPad. So. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I talked about my buddy getting his Genesis, and that I think that's what caused me to want to get one. I can't remember how I worked this because – I either saved up some money or I talked my mom into getting it for me, one or the other. Either I had money or I didn't. I can't see myself having a hundred and some dollars for a new uh, gaming system at the time. But I can remember talking to my mom and it was a I'm I'm I remember it being a dark, like cool, rainy evening. And I said, you know, hearts. We had a I don't know if you had a hearts around your area, but we had a hearts department store. And I talked mom into going down there and buying me a Sega Genesis. So I brought it home and hooked it up. And the Sega Genesis that I bought came with Sonic the Hedgehog. So I'm pretty sure this was 91. So I hooked it up and immediately was a fan. Loved the game. You know, Sonic had an attitude. This was the early 90s. And that was one of the things that Sega kind of rested its hat on was this attitude that, you know, came with the 1990s. And they portrayed that in a lot of their advertising, especially, you know, one of the one of the slogans, if you remember, Remember, Mark, as uh, Sega Genesis does what Nintendo don't. So they sold me. And I was a big fan, Sonic the Hedgehog, from there on out. I played the first game, the second game, uh, the third game. The second game I can remember my friend had, and I borrowed that. You could play, you, you mentioned Tails was part of that. You, there was a two-player aspect of that where I think you guys could race each other. And, and so recently, over the Christmas break, I bought Sonic Mania because I was feeling that throwback uh, kind of, you know, hey, this looks like, I, I heard a lot of great reviews of the game first off. I wanted to check it out, and it definitely had that throwback feel. And I will tell you that it probably has one of the best gaming soundtracks ever made. Uh, do, 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 <laughs> do, 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 Oh, there is a YouTube video. It's two and a half hours long, but all it is is just the full soundtrack to Sonic Mania. Uh, and I have listened to that probably 10 to 20 times in the past two weeks. It's really exemplary of what a soundtrack should be. Uh, but the game itself is awesome. I, I, just before I got on here, I was playing. I've got, I don't know, I think I'm like two levels before I can beat this thing. So I've been trying and trying and trying. And and uh, so I, I'm a big fan of, so, uh, of Sonic the Hedgehog and, and Genesis. So I knew what we was getting into here. Like I had said, the video game series released in 1991, Featuring the Hedgehog, Mark mentioned earlier, Dr. Eggman, or Robotnik, as he is uh, formally called. And Can I read the uh, solicitation here? Absolutely. Oh. All right. Sonic Genesis is a highly collectible book with a foil enhanced cover and features the biggest, most talked about Sonic comic story of all time, a fresh origin story popular with regular readers and a great way to be introduced to Sonic, which is, I believe I've read this before in my research, and this is why I picked it. Okay. The story has already received coverage by Nintendo Power Magazine, Game Informer Magazine, Newsarama, and CRR. So this is all coming from archiesonic.fandom.com. Okay. Sonic Genesis features tons of brand new artwork from fan favorite artists such as Tracy Yardley and Patrick Spaz. Spaziante, who is creating his highly anticipated first interior Sonic story artwork in nearly 10 years. So this incorporates the final seven pages of One Step Forward, which is issue 25. And then Genesis is 226, 227, 228, and 229. And then the epilogue is Two Steps Back, which takes place in uh, issue 230. And right. this is all the Archie Comics uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. They were gearing up here. This is uh, 2011 when this is occurring. Occur according to uh, Mike's Amazing World of Comics, they had the cover date as July 2011, on sale date June 1st of 2011. Why is that important? Because this is the 20th anniversary at the time of Sonic the Hedgehog being released. So, also, Mark, at, at the time this was getting released, they were gearing up for a game called Sonic Generations. I think it featured two Sonics, one from the 16-bit era and then one from latter eras, such as the, uh, oh my goodness, I'm trying to, I think they were, uh, Sega was on Xbox at this time, but Sonic, Ge Sonic Generations came out for Xbox 360, Sony PlayStation 3, and Nintendo 3DS. And you'll re if you read this and you're a fan of the series, you're going to notice quite a few things. After Robotnik re 
resets reality. All of a sudden, you're going to start recognizing some of the levels that were, you know, iconic in the Sonic series. So uh, I've got the synopsis pre-recorded. Sonic Genesis, collecting issues of Sonic the Hedgehog, number 225 through 230. Written by Ian Flynn, pencils by Tracy Yardley, Patrick Spaziante, Ben Bates, inks by Terry Austin, and colors by Matt Herms. In issue 225, we get the backstory at the beginning where we learn the history of what came before this issue with Sonic the Hedgehog, Sally his girlfriend, Mobius, the planet they live on. We also learn about the villain Dr. Ivo Eggman Robotnik who is always trying to rule the world with some kind of crazy plan and always seems to be foiled by Sonic the Hedgehog. There is also some history about villains called the Iron Dominion and a wizard by the name of Ixis Nagus, who had put into place an evil plot to make himself king. But in the waiting is Dr. Robotnik, who has bided his time and created the Death Egg. This is not the first time the world of Mobius has seen the Death Egg. And now, with this new threat... Sonic and his friends have to stand side by side with Ixus Nagus to attempt to stop Dr. Robotnik once more. While the Death Egg hovers over Mobius, Ixus Nagus attacks, providing a distraction for Sonic, Tails, and Sally to infiltrate the Death Egg to confront Robotnik in person. As Sally and Sonic go through the halls of the Death Egg, Sonic must face a Robotnik-constructed Silver Sonic. While that is happening, Sally takes off down a passageway to try and find Robotnik, but as she enters, a set of guns unload just as Dr. Robotnik presses a big red button that enacts his plan to reboot reality. Escaping the mechanized doppelganger, Sonic runs to the hallway to see his beloved Sally shot and possibly dead as everything fades to white. In issues 226 through 229, Mobius appears to be fine, and we catch up with Sonic, who appears to be running in the Green Hill Zone from the first video game, and he's investigating some people and animals that have been missing. Shortly after confronting and defeating Robotnik's assistant Snively, Sonic opens up a container freeing a bunch of animals and people. Inside are Sally and her friends, the frightened Antoine Depardieu and tech-savvy Boomer Walrus. Even though they do not remember each other at first, there are faint feelings they've met before, and that certain things they are doing in an attempt to confront Dr. Robotnik are also very familiar. The rest of these issues are Sonic getting to know his newfound friends, now on a mission to stop Dr. Robotnik, while also traveling through settings from the game series that people who have played will easily recognize. There is also something in the back of their minds that feels off, and as the issues progress, they begin to realize that they were in fact friends in a different reality, and as they travel towards Dr. Robotnik's Death Egg Lair, the planet Mobius is beginning to shake apart as reality is apparently trying to snap back. Meanwhile, Dr. Robotnik is having an easier time recollecting what came before, and his intentions are now to solidify the rest of reality by initiating Phase 2 of his plan. By the end of issue 229, Sonic has separated from his friends in order to try to stop Dr. Robotnik alone aboard the Death Egg as it is launched into space. While on board, Sonic faces off with a giant Dr. Robotnik robot and is nearly defeated while he sees a severed power wire lying on the floor just within reach. As Robotnik explains, the Death Egg is being powered by all of the Chaos Emeralds. Just before he is crushed beneath the boot of the giant robot, Sonic feeds the live wire into his own body, becoming supersonic, easily destroying the robot and using the Chaos Emeralds to harness Chaos Control, an ability to warp time and space in order to bring his original reality back, and also attempting to go back in time shortly before his girlfriend Sally was killed. In issue 230, reality snaps back, and Sonic realizes it is now moments before Sally gets shot. Ditching the robot Silver Sonic, he is able to rescue Sally before she is killed, while Dr. Robotnik does not understand why his button to reset the world will now not work. When Sonic finds Robotnik, Robotnik reveals he has one more trick up his sleeve. Due to reality being rewritten and then written again, Robotnik has initiated a phase of his plan that would result in the explosion and murder of a large amount of people on Mobius. Sonic is then attacked by Silver Sonic and a Metal Sonic, leaving Sally to once again try to find a way to stop Robotnik's plan. But as she does, she discovers she must sacrifice herself as the power source for the World Roboticizer is unleashed, causing a large feedback to result in a gigantic explosion. As the Death Egg crashes to the ground on Mobius, Sonic and Robotnik are still alive, and with no more plots left, Sonic is triumphant. 
However, as the rubble of the Death Egg shakes, Sonic turns in horror to see his love Sally emerge from the wreckage transformed into a giant robot. Give me your thoughts on Sonic Genesis. Okay, I think there's a great idea that just got rushed way too quickly. No. This, this, I know normally I'm the guy that's like, can't we do this in four issues? Can't we do this in six issues? Can we please do this in less than eight issues? This needed six issues. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like I would probably say six. more than that. I would almost say more than that, really. I mean, this... If you're, if you're doing Sonic Genesis, the motion picture, right, with this comic as your base... Your movie opens up and they're in the last, you know, they're in the last throes of this battle. You know, they're just about to, you know, take out the Eggman for good, Dr. Robotnik. Sonic and the, the, this group of like freedom fighter little critter animals are, uh, are, are on the verge of victory. And just before they're able to do it, he resets the universe. And now Sonic wakes up and he has no recollection of anything that's happened. He just knows his world is different. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't remem remember what ha he doesn't yet remember what happened before that. You need a good first act in order for him to just explore this new world. What's happening here? Why is this world different from the last one? Is it better or worse? Is this the kind of world that with no memory he would rather stay in? Or is it a, this nightmare that he's trying to wake up from and that's what triggers his mind? Do you understand what I'm saying? Do Dr. Robotnik resets the universe and in that first issue, I mean, Grant, I know it's kind of like a kid's comic. Kind of, it is a kid's comic. This wasn't like Sonic the Hedgehog for 40-year-olds. Sonic <laughs> fucks the world i mean <laughs> like that's not it <laughs> uh, um so i get it like i might be like oh, oh you know like putting a lot of too much thought into this but i just i felt like the beginning of it is a really great idea what if you wake up in a, in a nightmare world and mm -hmm. you don't remember how you got there or what it's all about and you have none of the things in you know around you that you had before you need time to explore that world. You need time to focus on the character and his reacting to that world. So just as an example, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., right? Mm -hmm. Agents, of Sh Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. did an entire uh, half a, or a third of a season that was Agents of Hydra. I know I've talked about this before. That's a really great example of how you, like, as dumb as that show got at times, the eight, that season with the Agents of Hydra stuff was phenomenal for network television. Mm -hmm. I want to stress that. It was, you know, it wasn't the wire yeah. but um <laughs> it's awfully good for network television so they created a universe in which mac uh has a daughter and he's not an agent of shield and he's not involved in what's going on with hydra and he's just living his life and he's not willing to help or do anything to upset that world to the point that even when they can prove it's a fictional world and that he's a, you know that, that he's just living in for all intents and purposes the matrix He's like, I don't care. In this world, I have a daughter. You know, and, I'm, and I'm not willing to lose that daughter. Like, you dumbass. She's not real. None mm -hmm. of this is real. You're letting the good, bad guys win. And he's like, I don't care. Yeah. Reality is perception. There needed to be that kind of element in this to, to the extent they can do that with a kid's book. So that's my problem with like the first part. I think, there's a, I think it's a great idea. I don't think they did anything with it, though, because just as soon as I mean, the whole thing is four is four issues long and these are not long comics. And so just as soon as he's deposited in this reset world. He almost instantaneously gets his memory back and he's and he almost instantaneously meets up with all the freedom fighters and they after a minute remember who they are and what they mean to each other and then they're off and running stopping the robotization of this world mm. which is the whole plot of this thing it was essentially he reset the world wipes everyone's memories and he's thinking well this should give me just enough time to turn everything into robots yeah. And then I'll control them and I'll be the master of this universe. Great. I get his motivation. I get his plan. I get why he set the Genesis wave off. What irritated me about it is that it went way fast and there were no stakes and there were there seemed to be no consequences to resetting this world. And it just it's just like you turn a page and another thing happens. You turn a page and another thing happens. And by the end of it, you're like, you did all of this effort to reset this world and fuck Sonic and his friends. And it got you nowhere. You were no further along <laughs> at the end of this thing. Thing than you were <laughs> before you reset this world. In summation, I thought it was a waste of a good idea. Okay. Did I lose so, you? 
No, no, I follow you 100%. There's, am, I, am I like a crazy person for putting way too much thought into this? Um, no, I, I okay. think that you, you did fine because I'm right there with you. This is something that I felt we had five issues, well, six issues total, counting the one where we got introduced to his friends before the world reset, and then the final issue where everything is get, gets basically reset back to somewhat normal. And I think that this is something that should have been way longer than it was. Yeah. Uh, because you're right. I can kind of see the shtick or the gimmick that they're trying to do here. If you look at the covers, the covers are reminiscent of the Sega Genesis games. Yeah. So I think what they're trying to do is like, OK, well, this will be Sonic 1. This will be Sonic 2. This will be Sonic 3. Or at least we'll shove elements yeah. in there. So they, that's they, in continuity, tried to retroactively make the comic into an extension of the video game. Yeah. There's another thing we have to remember, okay? As it's for children, shut the fuck up, you adults. You beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is Archie Comics. Archie <laughs> Comics, okay? Famous for, I think Archie Comics had the TMNT license at one time. And if you looked at those TMNT comics, they certainly were not the grim and gritty, dark comics that came before. No, this was the, tar the cartoon property. Sonic's going to be the same way. Although, I mean, they clearly have a storied history going into this. I mean, when you reach 200 and some of a 200 and some issues of a comic, that's a lot of history. And boy, did they let you fucking know it in that first issue. I've never <laughs> seen, I have never seen so many editorial notes in my entire life referring back to separate issues of comics. Like this happened in such and such issue. That Check out this issue. Check out, yeah. I mean, literally there was 10 of them. It's uh, very busy. Very. So not only are you going into this reset, kind of just... <sighs> I don't know. I, you know, it's Archie Comics. I don't think at the time that they were thinking, well, hey, we're just going to write this for the trade. In our first issue, they're referring so much to previous history between uh, with with characters in there. You can't just say, well, hey, this is going to be standalone because you have to know a lot of stuff. Granted, it wasn't like I was confused as to what happened before, but there there was enough enough of a uh, enough information to get me by so i was like okay well this person obviously had a, a previous history and then they kind of explain it but if you want to learn more about it go check out this issue so yeah w we can't put a whole lot of stock into what they are trying to do since it was archie comics which i don't even know if i've ever picked up an archie comic in my entire life since previous to 1998 on purpose i don't think i've ever bought anything so they are they're definitely geared towards the younger crowd and the younger crowd's not going to be too critical what they're going to see though and i think a lot of times what may be the reason why this thing gets so lauded is that the adults that grew up with the comic are kind of getting a throwback especially with you know right there when you open up that first issue after the world's been reset sonic is sitting there in the green hill zone you're like, oh, well, this looks familiar. Look, there's the loop-de-loop. -loop. Oh, okay, cool. There's a story well enough, but I think it definitely could have been expanded. Like, I mean, I want to see Sonic interacting with reality, and I want him to say, well, this is different because this happened. You know, I didn't really get that sense. All I, all I saw was where these two new characters pop up out of nowhere, uh, this Boomer guy, Boomer the Walrus, and Antoine Depardieu. <laughs> So I didn't know who these people were. I mean, the, the, these, these animals. I was just like, OK, well, apparently they've had a history before, possibly, I, I assume. Well, here they are now. And the only really familiar person in that group was Sally, who we met in that first issue. It was a fun adventure, but it definitely needed spaced out more. Um, it, the storytelling itself, they probably were like, well, hey, we got to get six issues in uh, because Sonic Generations is coming out. You do another six issues. That's another six months. You know, that's half a year and the game's probably already done. You want to try and get it done before then. So I understand probably where their what their position was, trying to get the story in. I mean, yeah, I certainly sympathize if they were like, well, we didn't have eight issues, you fucking assholes. <laughs> probably yeah. what it was. We also weren't writing this for 40 year olds. Calm the fuck down. Yes. I, I, I can certainly sympathize with all of that. But we are here to read comics and talk about them. Just, you know, look, I, I just finished reading all the entire uh, book of uh, five minute stories for Pete the Cat. I, I get books for children. I really mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're not going to sit here like, well, the problem with Pete the Cat is, you know, <laughs> it's like deconstructing Pete the Cat. Yeah, let's take Which, an hour and look at that. Yeah. We, however, we will be deconstructing Green Eggs and Ham. Yeah, well, it's happening. <laughs> it's going to be fun. There's room between it's not for adults 
and you made it too simple and too busy. You really didn't give an idea with this much weight enough room to breathe. Mm -hmm. I feel like a little more effort and a little less busyness. And maybe, I don't know. Maybe they're like, no, our shit's like time tested with kids. This was like our best selling stuff ever. The kids loved it. You know, (laughs) (laughs) just because your monkey ass wasn't thrilled with it doesn't, you know, doesn't mean shit. So I don't know. It's just, I think there's a great story here. Like if they do, like, if they ever do more with... I have never watched any of the Sonic cartoons. Uh, so I don't either. know if this was ever like adapted or not. I really don't know that much about the history of Sonic outside of the games. And even there, I'm like, oh, there were games. I, mm-hmm. I played them. They were rings. Um, some of the levels were harder than others. <laughs> Game expert right here. But I love this. I love the idea of the story. And it's something I would like to see fleshed out. You know, like if they ever do maybe like a Sonic animated movie. Because I don't think it would be even possible to do this as live action um, oh okay gotcha i was like wait but, a second they're they're already doing that, uh, but that yeah no. they put him in the real world like they did he-man in the 80s <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. this, you know the story behind that like they, they the reason why the masters of the universe movie with Dolph Lundgren was set in modern times and not in Eternia because it would have been like a th- billion dollar movie to make I'm sure I'm sure it would have and the people who the people who were doing that film did not have that kind of money what was that no canon? they did not that was yeah. canon right yep yeah they had two shillings and a hay penny that's what they had so <laughs> yeah. um so I get it like whoever I don't I gotta look and see who the license who owns the license on Sonic now for the movies but if they ever do like they did with Spider-Man and you know like there's live action Spider-Man movies but they also did an animated one because of the way that they were doing it they you know and they're in a lot of the reasoning behind the creation of the Spider-Verse movie they were like this is this would be better as animated I would love to see Sonic Genesis the movie but Mm -hmm. like an animated version because there's no way you could do those sets without basically making the movie already CGI, and then why aren't you just making it animated? Yeah. Like, there's no, like, what, why would you make this a live action? You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. You have to animate so much of it, you might as well just make the whole thing animated. Yeah. The only characters I was familiar with going into this book was Sonic and Dr. Robotnik. Nobody else have I ever seen or played a game with or read anything about. I didn't know about any of those other characters. Uh, so they were all new to me, uh, except for Tails, excuse me. So I know who Tails was. One thing I wanted to point out that I thought was pretty funny in the reset. <laughs> so, uh, you know, obviously this is for kids, but the the people who the people who wrote this kind of poked a little fun at it. There's a point where, and you may remember this, where uh, Sonic and the rest of the team separate. So mm-hmm. S- Sally and Boomer and the um, Antoine are trying to make their way to get to Dr. Robotnik. And so, again, like I said, they're going through different levels of the game, and there's a lot of familiar stuff from all of the games on the Sega Genesis. There's a point where they get to this, and when you play the game, you're so separated from reality, like you don't put a whole lot of thought into this. The best, the best representation of this on film was in Galaxy Quest when Sigourney Weaver, Sigourney Weaver's character is on the ship. Now you've, do you remember Galaxy Quest? Sure. Don't lie to me, Mark. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Between uh, fine and sure, you people, man. I sometimes I can uh, read your I can read you. You tell right, me if you've seen fucking Galaxy Quest. I have. All right, stop hitting me. That was basically like a Star Trek slash like uh, Lost in Space parody yeah. where, and I forget like the plot of it, but the, but that's what it is. Is they're actors on this show? Yeah, they're and actors on the show, and then they get they get abducted by some aliens because the aliens believe they're they're actually you know right. Okay. Okay. People who know their shit, but they don't. It's been a well, while. I, it's it's from what I understand, it's 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 very well loved, and it's a lot better than the actual Lost in Space movie. I agree. Uh, I will agree, even though I like Lost in Space. But there is a point in that movie, and you'll probably remember this, where they're running to go do whatever to try and get to the MacGuffin. Okay, they're trying to get to this one spot in the ship, and and they get to this part in the ship, and Sigourney Weaver rounds the corner, and she looks up, and it's edited out, but you can see her lips, and she says, fuck that. And what she's reacting to is in the middle of the ship are just like a, a set of like ten pistons driving back and forth and hitting each other. <laughs> the 
whole point. There's no point to the piston sitting there and, and doing that. The only thing is, is that it's a plot device that was written into the show. So the people who redid the ship, the people, the aliens that redid the ship thought that it was a necessary part of the ship. Well, all it was was an action scene, so all, so they could have to jump through the portions of of those in between those pistons, very much like a video game where they had to jump through and make it through and make it through. So anyway, uh, the point, the long point that I'm getting to is there's a point where Sally and Boomer and and Antoine have to stop because on in front of them is just this coil, and on the coil are just these rings with spikes, and right. they're just going back and forth. <laughs> Boomer looks at Sally and says, what are those? What are they even for? <laughs> so he's a, he completely recognizes like that half the shit that's in this lair just doesn't serve any purpose other than to potentially try and kill somebody. There's so, a uh, an old YouTube review, movie re- reviewer who he has since stopped doing movie reviews from what I understand. But um, back when he, I was... He wasn't invited <laughs> to Disneyland. <laughs> oh, not the same guy. Okay. No, no, he doesn't work for Collider. Got it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> where is like Starkey? I, I am done. I am done doing reviews. <laughs> no, he um he was one of the he was one of the first YouTube reviewers that I really liked, and uh he was he was confused Matthew, and what he he did a lot of he didn't use a lot of video. He did a lot of still imagery, and then he would supplement the still imagery with really crude pictures of himself, like like pencil drawings and you know like stick figures and shit. Mm-hmm. And there would be times where he would lose his, like, the kid was clearly on the spectrum. He definitely had some mental health issues going on. Okay. And he would fucking lose it with certain movies. And, like, his most famous one was The Lion King. He, like, fucking hated it because he hated He thought Simba was a shit character. And people just, like, wrote him endless fucking comments on his videos because of it. And I think that's how he gained a lot of notoriety was, like, he he's the guy that hates The Lion King. What a, what a thing to be known for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, he was talking about the Star Wars movies. I I believe it was either I believe it was him, but I feel like Red Letter Media made the same point. The scene in Attack of the Clones where Anakin and Padme are going through the robot factory, which is basically one one large Rube Goldberg machine, and they're having to jump over things and slide into them, and it's and it was pointed out that this was basically a video game that that the viewer couldn't play. Like you were watching. <laughs> <laughs> like you were just watching somebody else play a video game, which is hilarious because 10, 20 years later, that's all everyone does is watch other people play video games. Oh, but that's that a whole funny. other podcast. Jeez Louise. That's George Lucas, ahead of his time, once again, fucking genius he was. Yes, sir. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that, that totally reminds me of that that bit in Sonic, the the comic book that we were talking about, because it's like there's this whole scene where it's like there's this is just set up for us to 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 jump around. Yeah, that's all it is. Like, why is it here? I want to read you something real quick. Oh yes, let's hear it. So this is a nine year old's review of Sonic Genesis. Okay. 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 I'm reviewing a comic about my favorite character, Sonic the Hedgehog. I've been addicted to this character for the past two or three years. The characters in this comic are Sonic. Sally, Rotor, Antoine, and Dr. Eggman. In this comic, Sonic did what he usually did, smashing robots. But this time, he found something mysterious. It was some sort of some sort of a prison capsule. When Sonic broke the capsule, three mysterious animals came out, Sally, Rotor, and Antoine. After some introducing, Sonic decided to join them. Next, they went to the Marble Zone, where they found Eggman and defeated him quite easily. Well, that's my review. I hope you find it good, and please like. She did better than us. <laughs> good job, kid. Well, I, I, think it go- <laughs> I think it goes to what I was saying before of... <laughs> There's a great idea here. They don't do much with it, but they probably do just enough for the reader level of this comic. Uh, Darth Nightwing Phoenix, his review after the first issue. This is funny. I don't know if you've read this or not. Damn, Eggman figured it out. Sonic has plot armor. <laughs> <laughs> He's always had plot armor, but his friends don't. Plus, Eggman was launching a full-on reboot anyway, so deaths just before the universe is altered are pointless, since those lives are just restored in a different form with no memories of the previous universe, but they are restored. Now, that was the end of issue one. There, I kind of kept through these comments uh, as I, I kept going through them as we 
as I've progressed through the series. Issue two, this guy says, uh, so no one is going to comment about this whole thing being rebooted, basically? Just how did Eggman reboot the whole damn continuity like that? Which is fucking hilarious, because all he does is press a button. That's all he does is press a button. I have no idea how. I know, I know. And that's funny, because the reply to that is, like, with a red button, of course. (laughs) I was going to say, like, I'll take this over Crisis on Infinite Earths, which was a convoluted explanation that got to the same exact place. Well, I want to read DJ Kennedy's uh, DJ Kennedy 90s comment here. He says, so for those of you confused, this isn't nor was it ever supposed to be the reboot. Despite Sega wanting it at this point, the book wasn't having enough problems for them to force their hand yet. Now, remember, we're like 200 and some issues in. Yeah, 220, clearly, 225 is when this starts. Yeah, I mean, clearly for a comic to go that long. Mm-hmm. All right. That means a lot. I mean, really, there has and it's to gonna be go like another, like 100 issues, isn't it? Uh, I think it goes up to two. I was just looking at that 200 and 250 well 251 has it listed um in this off of fandom site so when worlds collide it goes to sonic the hedgehog 251 let me see if it keeps going after that no it doesn't have anything else after that um so okay so it says, despite Sega wanting it at this point, this book wasn't having enough problems for those to for, for them to force their hand yet. This was an event Sonic for Sonic's 20th anniversary, hence why the reason the Sat AM concept, Saturday AM, by the way, I think it was a I think that was a cartoon as well. Hence why the the reason the Sat AM concepts are molded into the classic slash Genesis games versions of the world. This wasn't even originally supposed to be in the cards. Clean sweep, clean sweep was presumed probably just supposed to be Eggman ruining everyone's shit with his new death egg, which would have led to Flynn's planned freedom fighters, which is the next story after this <clears throat> plot points that happen after the narrative returns to the main universe. It was only serendipity that it allowed for certain plot points to happen more easily. Okay. So anyway, yeah, that's just a long winded, long winded way of saying, you know, this, Again, this was a story that I don't think was completely planned at the time, and it may, the reason why it was so short was because it was so forced. Like, they're okay, okay, we got to get this in for Sega to make Sega happy. So. Like, it almost would have worked better as just a standalone story separate from the entire continuity, like a limited, a, no, a parallel universe, non-continuity, sort of elsewhere, Elseworlds tale of, like, Sonic and his friends... And then you can do you can do the same story, but now you have the time to let it breathe. Mm-hmm. Like maybe do tw- you know like a twelve issue limited series, you know a whole year. You know you begin it. But the first one or two issues is you know you can kind of tell the story of Sonic uh, and his friends taking out the robots and Doctor Robotnik and all of that, and him and this like kind of like you know as everything's kind of blowing up around him, you know hitting you know hitting the button and resetting this universe, and then you can let the story breathe and you have time with it. You know, and then, you know, when it's over, it's over. And it has, and then the other comic can just keep doing what it's doing. Yeah. So essentially it's the same thing without taking the time out of the actual comic. But giving, but giving this other idea the time that I think it deserves. I also want to read to you that some kid, like, wrote this girl who wrote this original review that I read. Oh, you're, we got a kid replying to the kid. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is a perfect review. <laughs> Your review sucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't read that. Um, I love Sally, and when I finished this book, I cried. And I'm in middle school. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, so... that, that, means, that means a lot to me. I mean, you're in middle school, and you are crying at the end of a comic. I think that, you know, that definitely holds some weight. That must mean... Uh, well, okay. I was I was emotionally invested in Sonic and Sally and their relationship, and and to see at the very end when you know Sally, you know they go through this whole long convoluted fucking plot explanation, which was just oh my gosh, it almost made my brain bleed about how <laughs> you know oh hey. You know, you remember when I turned all you guys to robots and Sonic's like, yeah, well, hey, you remember the aliens that came down and, and undid that permanently? And then Dr. Robotnik's like, well, guess what? I re- I altered reality or I, I reset reality. And, and you know what's going to happen now? Well, if I unleash the roboticizer, everybody who was robots before are just going to explode, which is pretty fucking. I mean, that's pretty dire because <laughs> there as he's explaining it. <laughs> You can see, like, 
like they're talking about what could happen and they're mm-hmm. showing it in panels and like pe- it, people are not exploding like on the panel but like buildings windows are exploding presumably because people inside those buildings are blowing up right so he's going to apparently kill everybody by unleashing this roboticizer and in, in a probably one of the like i mean it's a pretty sadistic plan that's pretty it's a pretty over-the-top evil plan because he looks at sonic and he's like you know we need to start over and w- what better way to get to rubble than you know to roboticize and explode everybody right. so and that's when of course sally does almost the exact same thing she did in the first issue uh runs off into a side passage and then creates this feedback thing where the roboticizer doesn't go out and hit everybody instead it comes back and hits the death egg causing the death egg to explode and oh by the way sally is a robot so I, I, the next arc i get the feeling like you know when you're turned into a robot i assume that that's you know there's not much coming back from that no um, what happened to what's her face the sister at the end of superman 3 Ooh, yeah she got fucked up didn't she yeah she did oh man ham sandwich lex luther he's <laughs> evil too nice call back <laughs> Right. I want to. So I want to read this, and I think this kind of sums up. This Sonic Genesis is clearly meant for two groups of people: one, young kids, and clearly and also middle schoolers. Apparently, they they're gonna have a different take on this. But I think this is also for like diehard Sonic fans. Like, like I played the game, but I don't have that sentimental attachment to it. To where like, oh my god, like what if the Green Zone were real, man? I fucking I don't smoke nearly enough pot for that. Yeah, that shit. Uh, Kind of like I said, divorce yourself from reality when you play these games because there's no fucking way they could exist in physical reality at least and well, make sense. I, well, again, I, I just don't have the attachment to it. Like seeing Captain America pick up Molina and chuck it at Thanos's fucking head. Mm-hmm. That I had a sentimental attachment to. I remember Captain America picking up the hammer in the comics, seeing it come to life. You know, seeing uh, Batman and Superman face off, a la The Dark Knight Returns. You know, with Batman in the fucking suit and everything, even though it went in a whole other direction. Just the iconic imagery of from the Dark Knight Returns uh, graphic novels. Yeah. These are things I had sentimental attachments to. And so when I saw them brought to life in in a uh, in a movie, I had an emotional reaction. This is meant for those people who have that kind of reaction to anything related to Sonic. It's awesome. Starting off in the green zone, Sonic thwarts the motobugs and neutrons that stand in his way. Finally takes down Eggmobile H and frees the animals from the capsule prison. Sound familiar? Thought so. How about lava hopping and Caterkiller dodging in Marble Zone? Yup, that's there too. Slipping and sliding through the ruins of the Labyrinth Zone? You bet. All of these iconic moments from the game beautifully reimagined in comic book format. And what happens when we get to the end of the game's zones? Emerald Hill Zone from Sonic 2. Woo! Yeah, then buddy. Chemical Plant Zone. Then Oil Ocean Zone. It just doesn't end. So clearly this was meant for guys like this person. Hey, I can feel that review, okay? Because when I was going through it, I was In like, co- oh. Do you feel it in your cockles? Oh, oh my goodness. Yes, I could. That was the call to the, of this book that made me, you know, the, the stuff that I enjoyed was the throwback. I like seeing all the old stages that I played when I played the Sonic game. Right. So, and if I, it means something to you, that's one thing. Like, it's yeah. just, like I said, I think that's my other. I'm looking at this purely as a story. This is more of an appreciation of the game. Mm-hmm. And I think you're probably right that when, when you're talking aesthetically, it, it, it was a winner, uh, in my opinion. But uh, when it comes to the story itself, it's a you know that's a that's a different story that's a that's a different thing altogether so all right man well you you summed it up there i will tell you that i had a good time reading it i didn't feel totally left out but you know i shouldn't expect much when you're thrown into a storyline that's happening uh in the 200s of uh of a property so that's fine that's fine i want to i want to read you something real quick read it Shadow the Hedgehog, the dark and grim ultimate life form, embarks on his first mission for the guardian units of the nation. He will travel time and space, Jesse Starcher, fighting killer robots and facing down beings of godlike power. This is Sonic fucking Universe 1, the Shadow Saga. Sonic fucking Universe. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, Archie Comics put that one on the cover. I like to make it sound. I like to throw the word fuck into things to make it mm. for like extra emphasis. It does. So what so was the, it? Yeah, against? man. Yeah, Sonic Universe 1, the Shadow Saga. Do you know much about Shadow the Shadow the Hedgehog? <laughs> Okay. No. The, okay. <laughs> Come on. Come uh, on, here, Jesse. <laughs> here's what you do. You take Sonic, uh, you pilot swap him and give him a little black instead of blue. <laughs> And then you give him a gun. I am not fucking kidding, Mark Radlich. <laughs> How are we not reading this right now? Shadow the Hedgehog. Uh, yeah, he's he's a gun welding hedgehog, sir. <laughs> I have no, I can't say I've you played. You sound any like games. you have a fucking headache right now. <laughs> I had a headache before this. That's because I think I knew this was happening. But no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I dreaded it all day. It's like, what's wrong? I got a podcast tonight. My head hurts. So I'm looking at just real quick. Shadow of the Hedgehog first showed up in Sonic Adventure 2 in 2001. All right. Well, get more grim, dark Sonic the Hedgehog. Mm, and when they started going into like the 3D aspect, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like for I, I don't know if that was for Sega Saturn or what was the other one? The Dreamcast. I think they might have had a Sonic game on that. I was not interested. I just wasn't. There wasn't anything that made me go. Oh man, I've got to play that. It just it didn't feel right. I like the 2D side scrolling blast processing Sonic the Hedgehog. And when you get into the 3D stuff, like one of the worst games ever for the Xbox and PlayStation, I think is Sonic 2006. Like they will tell you that that game sucks complete ass. Um, <laughs> and it's just like you have Sonic the Hedgehog very much. <laughs> no, that's kind of scary. Now that I think about it, but uh, Sonic the Hedgehog is interacting with, with humans and like he falls there's a storyline where the girl like a human girl a princess like you would see from final fantasy there's and there's these long ass cut scenes but regardless there is this human girl that falls potentially in love with sonic all right we're crossing a little bit of a species boundary there let's get out of here so that is our coverage of sonic genesis this is the best podcast we've ever done oh yeah i guarantee you Ten thousand likes, um, <laughs> all sorts of shares. People will be sharing this left and right. Uh, so, all right, Mark. Well, let's talk about what we've got upcoming on the Radlich and Broadcasting Network. So, last week we did uh, Harley Quinn and the Birds of Prey, the the trade that collects various comics that focuses on each one of the characters that's in the movie we reviewed the movie birds of prey jesse and i reviewed sepultura quadra and then alexis Haina and i reviewed the old wb one season tv show one and done jesse starcher birds of prey you can check out all of our shows in the archive if you somehow came across this show either by you know showed up in your twitter feed or something you're not subscribed Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. We're W2M Network on any podcast app. And if you happen to be listening to us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, etc., if you can go ahead and give us a star review, leave a comment, we would greatly appreciate it. If you're one of the people who I insulted, let us know that I insulted you and you're not going to take it and call me a fucking asshole. (laughs) We encourage that sort of thing. Man, oh man. Hey, if you guys want to check out Unspoken Issues, it's the other comic book podcast to do right here on the W2M Network. Chris and I sat down and had a discussion about Batman versus Predator, and it should be airing this Wednesday. That's the plan anyway. Other than that, we are going to get out of here. I'll let the can plugs do the talking. That over there is Mark Radlich. I am Jesse Starcher. Have a good one. Uh, Bye-bye. Thank you very much for joining us. Do not forget to subscribe to our new home by punching in W2M Network on just about any podcast platform to get all of our content into your audio feed. Also, give a like to the Rattlich in Broadcasting Network and W2Mnet.com Facebook page in order to stay on top of everything that we have to offer. If you'd like to follow the Source Material podcast on social media, just follow at Source Matcast on Twitter, and we are on Facebook at Source Material Comics Podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please feel free to share... We look forward to entertaining you again soon. You ever hear that growing up in Appalachia? What? Do you got Jews where you live? Do, 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 do. And the guy that played Cyclops. Oh, okay. James Mars, Marsdale? James Mars, Mars Bar. Mars Bar. <laughs>
<laughs> James Snow. I, I've got James it here. Wik- Wikipedia says his actual name is James Snickers. And this time, Sonic is able to use the Chaos Emeralds, or as my friend used to call them, the Chaos Emeralds. No, no, no. My father wrote, "I'm too." My son is too stupid to learn this on my own. Oh homework yes, once. that one. And I'm, I'm using and I've it. Absolutely, gotten over it. Um, <laughs> hope you're listening, Dad. You like this podcast? Yeah. What do you think of this podcast, Dad? Maneuver through this Rube Goldberg, ma- Goldberg machine. Is that Rube? Rube Goldberg, sir. They I have got your to. Back. Three, two, two, one, go. The scene where Anakin and Padme have to maneuver through the Rube Goldberg machine. Did I say it right? Rube Goldfarb. <laughs> it's not Goldfarb. <laughs> oh Rube. fuck! Now, now I'm starting to wonder. I think it's Rube Goldfarb. Rube. I'm not Rube gonna Gold- fuck this up. It is. I'm- and by the way, I am not the kind of girl. Oh god, fuck me. And blah 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 blah. You fucking weirdos. We don't uh, judge on this podcast. Not at all. I'm not a complete fucking asshole. I'm not the least <laughs> bit. Uh, Bestiality? That's the one. No, no. I'm not the one trying to fuck the hedgehog. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we covered it last Thursday. Fuck you and your time travel. I didn't think there was a lot to talk about, but we certainly figured it out. What they call padding in the business. That's, <laughs> that's what that's what that was all about. So Yeah, I was gonna say have fun editing that one. <laughs>